Um, all right, so let's talk a little bit about some WebAssembly stuff. Um, basically, the first thing that we're going to talk about today is the WebAssembly format itself. Um, so uh, basically, like WASM is a binary format. We're going to talk about what that means, and we're going to talk about what's in it. I think a lot of web developers haven't dealt with binary formats before, so we're going to like demystify it a little bit. Uh, and then we're going to talk about how WebAssembly has some challenges when it comes to debugging. Um, it's definitely not impossible, it's just a little different, and there's a bunch of stuff going on there. And as part of that, we're gonna be talking about some things called ELF, DWARF, and source maps. Um, made a little Tolkien joke there. Uh, there's there's some, some good puns going on in this space uh, around these kind of tools. So um, that's kind of what we're gonna get into is like the details of the WASM format, stuff about debugging, that kind of thing. So, uh, what is the .wasm format in the first place? So we didn't really like, I sort of assumed there's like this .wasm format, but let's talk about like what that means and how it fits into WebAssembly. So WebAssembly is a specification that is standard by the W3C. Um, like many other web standards, although the WattWG is also doing some standardization nowadays, uh, the W3C is the like, you know, sort of OG standards body. And so um, as that means that in some sense, WebAssembly is like a specification and then there's software that implements that specification. So that means there's a lot of like details and stuff that's kind of like outside of the spec that still is practical when it comes to actually using a thing, right? Like standard says like, this is what exists, but you don't, that doesn't necessarily mean that it can covers everything that matters to like day-to-day -day development when you're actually using the technology. Um, and so this talk is kind of a little bit, the first part is about what's in the standard. The second part is about all this stuff that's being done outside of the standard to make it sort of usable for many people. Um, and uh, I'm gonna be uh, like talking a lot about the spec. The specification is really good. Um, if you haven't read a lot of specifications before, um, I think the WebAssembly standard is a great way to get started learning specifications. Um, maybe I've read too many <laughs> older or bad specifications before, but um, I really, really like the WebAssembly spec and I think it's fantastic for getting started. Um, if you haven't read specs before, you may find it like a little bit confusing. Like obviously if you give it a try and you struggle, don't worry about it, um, but it's just, it's more manageable than other specifications from what I found, especially given the like amount of detail that it goes into, which is helpful when you're trying to learn about the details, but it can also be a little overwhelming for times. Um, and so uh, you can read all of it on the web. I'm gonna be posting some screenshots of it in this presentation, but if you go to uh, webassembly.github.io slash spec, you can actually read the whole thing. And when I have screenshots, they're from various parts um, of that specification. So there's uh, sort of these, actually the WebAssembly spec defines these sort of two big situations. Um, it's not really the right word, but whatever. Um, it defines WebAssembly itself, but also this thing called a host environment. And this is one of the things I really love about WebAssembly is that it's very forward thinking. So, um, so the WebAssembly spec defines WebAssembly itself. And that has a number of these sort of like top, top level sections and they sort of describe what makes up WebAssembly. So there's kind of the structure of what WebAssembly is and then um, validation, which is a really interesting thing I'll get to in a second, how WebAssembly is executed. And then finally two different formats. One is a binary format and one is a textual format. The binary format uses the .wasm extension and the text uses the watt extension for WebAssembly text but it's also kind of just a general joke. Um, I think that the, the folks that made WASM knew that would be kind of funny, and so they, uh, they ended up picking that. Um, so most of the time you would like, so it's, it's important to understand this distinction because there's kind of like the structure of a WebAssembly program is sort of like abstract, and then the binary and text formats are the like representation of how that format is defined in the computer. But you could make alternate formats if you wanted to. And in fact, there was a competing textual format for a little while, um, but it sort of coalesced around this .wat format. Um, so like they did a really nice job of splitting out the sort of like abstract description from the actual bits of how you represent that abstract description, which is really cool. 
Um, it also means like this validation section is really cool because WebAssembly has several ways that you can sort of like validate that it's well formed um, in the first place. So um, as sort of an example, uh, you can verify that the types that are in, because WebAssembly is typed, I don't really talk about that um, exactly, but you can validate that all the types match up without actually executing any of the WebAssembly itself. And this is really important for security properties on the web, for example. Um, it's really important that you're able to check that certain properties exist ahead of time. Um, and that's like a, a really cool aspect. And so they describe how you would go about validating a bunch of these properties without actually needing to run the code itself. And then the execution describes a little bit about the how the, the WebAssembly programs are actually executed. And you can do this in a number of different ways, and we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, so that's like WebAssembly proper. Um, and uh, then there's also this host environment. So it's it's like WebAssembly is always defined as running in the context of some other thing, which sounds sort of weird until you think about regular programs, right? Like regular programs very rarely run on their own. They're almost always run in the context of, say, an operating system. Um, some programs are operating systems. They run in the context of hardware. Um, so we're kind of like almost always inside of some other thing when we're talking about software. And WebAssembly makes that explicit and separate, which is really cool because it means that things are more flexible. And so um, there's kind of this running joke that like WebAssembly is neither web nor assembly. Um, and so like WebAssembly is actually broader than the web itself because the people who wrote the spec were able to separate out the web parts from the non-web parts. Um, so like the spec talks about having an embedder that embeds the WebAssembly like runtime inside of itself um, and how those boundaries operate. And so there's kind of two embedders that are in the specification itself as well. This is the JavaScript and web embedders, but anyone can sort of like define their own um, other sort of embedding framework. And we're gonna talk about at least one more of those later in this presentation. But um, kind of the way you might think about like, what's the difference between JavaScript and web? Well. It's sort of the same way that like you have Node in the browser. Um, you know, JavaScript is also broader than the web and can run outside of a web browser context. So they, they very cleanly separated out the stuff that's needed for a JavaScript embedding in a pure JavaScript setting, and then one that would be in the context of the web platform and how that would happen. So a lot of people tend to think about WebAssembly as being this thing that's built into the web platform, but it's, it's significantly broader and kind of always has been. Um, you know, JavaScript was built inside the web platform and then kind of pulled out. The foresight was there to actually make it separate in the first place. And this distinction is going to become very important when we talk about debugging, um, because how debugging works is different based on what host environment you have. Um, and so that's part of this challenge, which is why I bring this up. I, this is one of my favorite aspects of WebAssembly, but it's not just because I love it. It's because it's actually like relevant to the stuff we're going to be talking about uh, here pretty soon. So I sort of gave a small overview of these already, but I'm gonna talk about each of these four sections just briefly. Um, so the structure, like WebAssembly is its own programming language in a sense, um, but it has different actual concrete representations. Like I said, the binary and text format. And so they have a common structure. So that's what this like part of the specification um, talks about is this abstract structure. Um, so I mentioned before the validation is important because you can check that certain things make sense. Um, and so like there's like this type system that's involved and it specifies all of the things that happen inside. Um, and so one of the things I think is really cool though, and the cool thing about the WebAssembly spec is that um, it says here, all rules are given in two equivalent forms, in prose describing the meaning in an intuitive form and a formal notation describing it in mathematical form. So a lot of specifications choose one or the other. WebAssembly decided to choose both. If you're a mathy kind of person, you wanna do the like formal version, that's like great, it's much more concise. But if you're not really a mathy person, like I'm not really that mathy of a person, to be honest with you. Um, I tend to read the prose version of this, which sort of describes it in words. And they consider both of them canonical. So if there's a bug, if there's something that diverges between these two explanations, they consider that a bug. And this is, I think, really helpful for making the spec accessible to folks. Um, it's just like really nice. It's cool to see them put in the work to do both versions. Um, so executing. So what happens is um, WebAssembly has this thing called modules. So the, the unit in WebAssembly is a module. And so WebAssembly code gets executed when you instantiate a module and then you call a function. 
And so ha that is like kind of what kicks off the process of running things. Um, in languages that have like a main function, you could imagine that being something like main. Uh, in languages that don't, you could imagine that as being when you load up a file into your interpreter or whatever. Um, and so this describes like how the thing gets executed. And importantly, this is also described in relatively abstract terms. Um, and so uh, this allows you to have multiple different implementations. So for example, browsers tend to implement WebAssembly in terms of the JavaScript runtime. They reuse parts of their JavaScript virtual machine to, to implement WebAssembly. But folks have actually built their own WebAssembly runtimes that exist totally separate from everything else. And that's enabled by building out this like execution specification. Um, and so that's like another really cool area of flexibility. Um, if you happen to know what this means, uh, this is a positive thing, but uh, WebAssembly is a stack machine. Um, so if you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. It's not that really that important. Um, we're not gonna talk about that aspect of WASM, but there are other talks you can get into that sort of talk about what that means. But basically in virtual machines, there's two major kind of like architectures. One is a stack architecture and one is a register architecture. And uh, WASM is a stack machine, not a register machine. I don't have enough time to talk about the details there, but that's just like kind of an interesting side effect. Um, same thing here, pros and formal definition, which is really cool. Um, Finally, the binary and text format. Um, so the binary format uh, basically is just like put the, the syntax into binary and then the uh, Watt format uh, is the text format and it turns things into S expressions. So uh, if you loved Lisp, then uh, Lisp lives on inside of WebAssembly. There's sort of an interesting history here where JavaScript was like, some people wanted it to be a Lisp in the first place. And a lot of the folks who wrote early JavaScript are very big Lisp people. This is kind of like a joke, the Lisp's revenge is that uh, WebAssembly is like, has this S expression style syntax. But um, we're gonna look at both of these formats um, in the rest of the presentation. But an interesting property of it when it comes to debugging is that these formats are equivalent. So you can take the text format and turn it into binary, and you can take the binary format and turn it into text. And so the advantage of the binary format is that it is smaller and more compact. And if you think about, you know, when you're downloading an asset uh, over the internet, you want it to be as small and compact as possible. So that is tends to be how things are used in that sense. But if you want to read it, you know, many people don't read binary, um, although there are some embedded folks who, uh, you know, work with it every day and so develop a certain amount of ability to kind of like see the code as you will. Um, but uh, most people would want to look at stuff in the text format. And so being able to make this happen is something that like is important. Um, it was like a really key part of making sure that, um, you know, the web, like you can read the JavaScript code that is running in your browser, at least in theory. Um, and so it was important there be a text format too, um, to keep that kind of property. Um, Okay, so host environments. Um, I talked a little bit about the browser earlier and you can run WebAssembly in your browser. Um, this is following all the W3C3 specifications around the browser host environment. And there's more work to be done here that's actually very interesting. The one that everyone loves to talk about is DOM access. Um, and so like right now, WebAssembly can't directly access the DOM. It can call into JavaScript code though, and JavaScript can touch the DOM. So you kind of get this chain process where if you want WebAssembly to do DOM manipulation and calls into JavaScript and JavaScript does the work. There is a, a proposal that would let WebAssembly sort of not just interact with the DOM directly, but interact with sort of any kind of like external resource that the host might want to expose. Um, and it's called the host bindings proposal. And so that will be a thing that um, happens that allows this to work. But there's a bunch of other stuff you can imagine that would be useful inside of WebAssembly that does not exist today. So there's more work happening in that, um, in that browser environment. There's also what I'm calling sort of like the system environment. So I'd mentioned before that like, uh, you know, you can run WASM outside of a browser and you need to define, you know, ways of making that happen. Um, Mozilla and other folks have come up with a specification called WASI, which stands for WebAssembly Systems Interface. And it kind of defines the ability for WebAssembly to talk to file systems, the network on its own without dealing with the browser, graphics, audio, input, encryption, like all this other kind of stuff that you might expect from a, a, a application that's running natively as opposed to in the browser. Um, and so this has been kind of like, a, um, there's several other people that are involved in this spec and it's kind of gaining steam as sort of the de facto way to run WebAssembly programs outside of the browser. Um, and so this is kind of really, really cool. 
Um, and so we get the ability to like run WebAssembly programs um, outside of the browser as well. And there's tons of reasons why that might be valuable, valuable to folks. I don't really have time to get into them um, entirely in this talk. So I'm just gonna kind of say that's useful and sort of leave it at that. Um, as part of this, uh, there, all of these things I just covered could be its own talk on its own. If I moved a little quickly and you got a little lost, don't worry because there's just so, so, so many things going on here and there's a rich amount of information to learn. And so um, I could give a 45 minute talk about almost every single one of these, probably multiple talks about many parts of all the stuff that I just described. Um, we're gonna focus on one particular aspect though, which is the binary format itself and how that impacts debugging. Because as I mentioned, like if you're doing WebAssembly stuff in a browser, you're probably downloading the binary format and executing it because you want that small um, size that a binary format affords you. Um, and you're probably going to want to be able to like debug your application. So you sort of need to confront this. And I think this is an area where it's a lot of interesting and active development. Um, and so this also, I think, really matters because, as I sort of mentioned briefly before, um, a lot of people, as I've made up this kind of quote on the right hand side here, uh, a lot of people think that like they're fearful about WebAssembly because they know that JavaScript, um, you're able to read the code that comes into your browser and that's like an important property of them. Um, and so that's also sort of a, basically a version of debugging. Like I wanna know what my browser is executing, I wanna be able to read it. That's like a fundamentally a debugging process. And so I think that um, talking about debugging is really important for getting the folks that are um, a little worried about this on board with WebAssembly is kind of like a general thing. Um, okay, so, uh, Dot .wasm files, the binary format. How do you get a dot .wasm file? Well, fundamentally what happens is you compile a program into a WASM file. And I say compile because you need to sort of ahead of time generate the whole thing. If you have a language that's not compiled ahead of time, or I should say an implementation, because languages can be both, but like whatever, you get it. Um, if you have sort of an interpreter with your language, you also need to compile that interpreter as well. Um, and so you kind of get larger binaries with languages that need to have an interpreter, and that's a whole nother section about WebAssembly that's not part of this talk. Uh, but just like you get everything your program needs. So you get a Ruby program, you want to compile it to WebAssembly, you need to compile not just your Ruby, but also the Ruby interpreter. It produces a big giant .wasm file. Um, and then uh, an, an implementation will actually execute that according to the execution section in the spec. So you hand that WASM file to some sort of uh, implementation and it runs it. Um, and so this makes debugging really interesting because, you know, if you compile your program into .wasm, uh, you don't have the source code anymore. Um, and so this is like step number one that's the big problem is you sort of lose in translation. Um, you know, if you think about a, a, a dynamically typed scripting language, like say JavaScript or Ruby or Python or Perl or any of those other languages, you sort of like execute the source code to some degree. Um, obviously there's JITs and compilers and all this other stuff, but like you step through the source code and you see the source code kind of like running. Um, when you're debugging stuff. But uh, if you compile this into WebAssembly, all that information is gone. So like, what do we do about that? Um, I'm gonna be uh, using this tool called WASM Code Explorer. I put the link down here at the bottom. Um, this is a really useful way of visualizing the binary format. And uh, I put it here because I didn't have room on all the slides that I'm gonna use it for later. So I just wanted to like mention briefly that that's a really great tool that I use all the time to like look at WebAssembly binary output. Um, so let's take a look at an actual example of this happening. Um, so here's a Rust program. You don't really need to know Rust for this presentation. This is the only Rust code in the slide, but I had to pick a language and Rust has put a lot of work into making WebAssembly great. So um, here on line one, we use this WASM bind gen, which is a thing that generates bindings to WebAssembly. Um, and then on line four, we make a function called add one that takes a 32-bit number and returns a 32-bit number and we add one to it. It's pretty straightforward. Um, and that line, line three, that annotation says, hey, we wanna expose this to WebAssembly. So this is an example, of, like you could write this program in VS Code or whatever, um, I'm using code here, uh, and then you compile it um, via a tool, uh, depending on you know what language you're using. Um, in this case, I use WASM Pack, which is a great tool written to help do Rust and WebAssembly stuff. And then you get the .wasm file out. Um, what does the .wasm file look like? Well, here is that uh, WASM Explorer tool I was showing you before. Um, it shows you all of this binary kind of like on the left and then what it renders like into ASCII on the right, which is kind of interesting, but uh, it also color codes all of the individual sections. We're gonna talk about sections in a second um, and then like highlights them as you move your mouse over. So you see that one that's like that light blue color because I was highlighting my mouse over when I took the screenshot. 
but you kind of get this um, all this binary code. And so this is the what the Rust compiler put out. I actually compiled it this morning. Um, this is the like the outcome that comes out of the compiler when you compile that previous program. You get this. Um, and so uh, this is like what we're going to talk about is how does this format actually like work. Um, this is the equivalent dot wat to that wasm. So it gives you kind of this better text representation. You can see all the parentheses because of the S expression, and they're kind of all these little sections in between. So we're going to go back and forth and talk about both of these things. Um, I don't have time to explain all of the details from this example because I want to talk about debugging stuff. But um, this is kind of like the sort of hello world, if you will, of WASM um, formats. So you see that first line says module, and then everything else goes inside of it. As I mentioned, uh, a WebAssembly, like a dot WASM file, defines some sort of WASM module. And inside the module are all these other things called sections. So we have type, memory, export, export, func, and data. And those are sections. You can also have custom sections, and there's other types of sections that aren't in here. But the rough structure is like the file defines a module, and then inside the module is defines all these sections, and the sections all define different stuff. So, so you can imagine that func section defines that function that we are uh, you know, calling to add one. And then the export, you can see right above it, there's a export add one that exports that function. So it's like saying, hey, I'm, I want somebody outside of this module to be able to call this function. Um, like I said, there's a lot going on here. We're not gonna get into all the details, um, but uh, yeah. So that's kind of like, this is what's inside your computer. And then this is what you can like produce from it to like make something that's a little more readable. Um, so here's an example from the spec um, describing modules. So uh, it says like, hey, there is a, an encoding of a module, starts with a preamble that contains a four byte magic number, which is a string backslash zero ASM, and then a version field. The current version is one. Uh, it's then followed by sections um, and like, you know, you can do whatever you want. And so it says magic here, 0x00, 0x61, 0x73, 0x60. Um, and then version is one and then a bunch of zeros and then the module section afterwards. So if you were looking at the spec and you were like, okay, how do I map this to the binary code that's actually in the .wasm file? Well, maybe it's a little small. Um, if you double click on, this, on the uh, slides, you can get a little bigger, but you can see that that exact same stuff, the 0061736D, uh, that .asm, that's the first four bytes of the file. Um, and then that version is the next byte, so 01000000. So we can see how that spec corresponds directly to this binary output. And um, you know, in, in lots of languages, you don't necessarily deal with binary files a whole ton. Um, and I wanted to whip up an example here, but I felt it was getting a little long. But the point is, you can just open up the file and read it byte by byte um, in whatever programming language you want. And if you wanted to see, like, is a program a WebAssembly file? you would need to look at the first four bytes and see, do they match up with this magic number? Um, and that would let you know that it's a WebAssembly file. And then you can see what version of WebAssembly it's, it's encoded with by looking at the next four bytes. And so kind of the process of stepping through and working with a binary file is literally just matching up the words in the spec to the structure here. You can think of it just like JSON, right? Like you parse some JSON, you pull out the very first thing, you, you know, compare how it like looks to whatever you're expecting and you go through it. Exact same process, just like a little more compact and maybe in a way that's like slightly more awkward from higher level languages. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so then um, as like a, so this is again, the, like uh, the code that we had, we're going to uh, now talk about this section. So the very first bit here, the type section. So WebAssembly is typed. And so this is saying, hey, there's a function that takes in a 30, I32 as a parameter and returns an I32 as a result. Um, it happens that Rust and WebAssembly both share the I32 type. So even though it was in the Rust code, this is the WebAssembly I32 type, just to be clear. Um, but this, how is this actually represented in the WebAssembly file? Well, I'm not gonna get into all the details because this is not just like Steve reads the WebAssembly spec to you, but um, if you look at the next bytes that come after, so we talked about the magic number, we talked about the version field, the very next section says 0106. And in the spec, I didn't actually put a copy paste to this yet, um, it says, hey, the type uh, section starts with the number 01. So you would like expect that like, okay, I need to see what section is the first section of this module. So I read the first byte is zero one. Oh, that means that this is a type section. And the zero six, um, 
that corresponds to the rest of it. So if you count here, this one, two, three, four, five, six, there are six bytes in the sort of like body of the type section. And so that number six is what's encoding how, how long, like how big is this particular section? And so every section follows this kind of rule. If you look on the second line there, you'll see 0302 and then two purple bits after the 02. It's the same deal. 03 is a section that corresponds to a different part of the WebAssembly spec. And then there are two bytes long. So we say, okay, there are gonna be two bytes for the next module and it repeats. Um, so you say like type and then the length and then you say what the length is. Um, and so that's kind of like how the rough structure of this whole file is formatted. You have like magic byte version, then a list of sections where it goes section type, section length, however many bytes is in the length section type, section length, however many bytes in the length, and you just keep going and going and going. And so all of these, the different color codes map to different parts of the spec, but fundamentally that's like how the file is structured and that's all that it is. So, um, you know, once you get comfortable with your language's ability to read bytes and compare them to things, like you can whip up something that reads the structure, at least the structure of like how many sections are there and what are their types is like pretty easy to get going. Um, I did it in like a, a weekend basically. And I didn't even need to like spend all weekend to do it. It was just like in my spare time, I happened to go through. Um, and so it's, it's, it's like not that bad once you get into it. And then it feels like magic because for some reason, even though like JSON is also stored as binary on, on the disk, working with binary formats feels harder than working with text formats. Um, but like once you get into it, it's not, it's not that bad. Um, okay, so uh, this is the, the example code again. Um, you would imagine we go to the memory section after the type section, blah, 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 all those kind of things. All right, so. That's kind of like the, the rough um, talking about these two formats, how they relate to each other and how the encoding goes. You can read the rest of the spec to see the details about how all the other sections work. Um, I'm not gonna get into those right now because I wanna talk about challenges with debugging this thing. Um, so obviously you wrote your Rust code or Ruby code or Python code or JavaScript code or whatever. JavaScript doesn't compile a WASM yet, sort of, and it's complicated. Um, but uh, you probably wanna be able to debug your program. So there's gonna be some issues there. First of all, the, main, the big issue in the first place is different people debug differently. So some people use printf debugging as it's called, um, printf being the way that you print strings to the screen and see. Um, this is actually surprisingly tricky uh, in, in WebAssembly. Uh, I'll get into that in a second. Uh, the second one is like debugging in the browser. So you know, if you have a web application, you've written some WebAssembly, you wanna be able to debug it. You probably wanna do that in the browser. Um, how does that work? Uh, you can do printf debugging in the browser, sometimes called console.log debugging, um, but uh, you, know, you also might wanna do something a little more complicated as well. Um, and how does that work? And then finally, like debugging outside of the browser, you don't have any of the affordances the browser has and like you don't necessarily like know how to print stuff to the screen because you know you would need the format to like describe that. Um, and so I think the, the real key here is that debugging means different things to different people and they do it in different environments. And so that's fundamentally what makes this challenging is that like you can't just say like, okay, this is how we're gonna debug the code. You need to be able to support people in whatever way they wanna do the debugging and whatever environment they wanna do the debugging in. So we talk about working on debugging for WebAssembly, that's gonna be like one of the largest challenges that happens. Um, there's also some other challenges too beyond that part. Um, so we, as we had mentioned earlier, we don't have the source code. The WASM file does not store the source code of our program at all, and we've sort of lost that in translation. But when we do our debugging, we don't probably wanna look at the actual output. We want to uh, look at the source code of the language that we wrote it in. So that's also like a problem. And as I mentioned before, we have different environments, browsers, different dev tools, don't have dev tools or like, capital D, capital T dev tools, right? Like it's thing that only makes sense in the context of the browser. Um, but uh, when you think about these problems, like another like sort of big issue here is there's even different like amounts of instructions. So when I wrote the Rust, I said X plus one. But if you look at the body of the, the WebAssembly text format, that X plus one is actually kind of like two or even three instructions, depending on how you think about it. Um, there's the get the value of the local variable, which is the argument that's passed in. Then there's the like push one onto the stack uh, with the second line there. And then there's add, which pops those two numbers off, adds them and pushes the result back on. So these kind of three steps in the WebAssembly thing correspond to one step in our source code. 
So like, if we wanted to step through the WebAssembly instructions, do we like keep the source one at the same line? Do we step through the source code, but we jump a number of WebAssembly instructions? Like, this is also a, a kind of an interesting challenge whenever you're translating back and forth between the formats. Even in this kind of very small WebAssembly file, we run into this problem. Um, so that's kind of like the, the problem set here. Um, and we're gonna talk about how people are solving that currently. So um, I'm gonna explain the current state, but what I wanna also impress on you is that this is a really active area of development in WebAssembly, and so a lot of stuff is in flux. Um, this may not be the stuff I'm talking about, like may not be the final story. We're actually gonna talk about one sort of like false start. Um, and so it looks like people are in a decent place, but they, we're not done yet, and there's some, some reasons why that's true, and we're gonna talk about it. Um, and then finally, like there's a lot of work left to do. Um, I, all of this is kind of like demo quality, I would say. Um, people have not really done a whole lot of this like in production, and so uh, you know that means that things might change based on that sort of feedback. So um, you know this is like very, very cutting edge kind of area. That leads us to our third section: Elf, Dwarf, and Source Maps. Um, so. Uh, as I've been talking about this, I've kind of been presenting this as like a novel problem, but you may be like, hey, we also compile our JavaScript, not just in like the sense that V8 has a JIT and does just-in-time compilation, but also like we transpile and minify our JavaScript, and so that's like a kind of compilation on its own, and we don't have the original source code whenever we send our compiled, our minified and transpiled JavaScript to the browser. Um, and people needed to debug those applications, and to do that, they added source maps. Um, and so source maps, kind of like it says, uh, it maps the source code to the like outputted JavaScript source code, and that's how your browser's dev tools is able to kind of like understand where in your original code the, the new JavaScripts, you know, what it uh, corresponds to. So the um, the initial thought behind how to debug WebAssembly is like, hey. We do this, we had this problem in JavaScript, we solved it with source maps, so why not use source maps with WASM? And that seems totally fine. Um, Mozilla actually did this back in 2017. Um, this is a, a tweet from Flocky, uh, who works at Mozilla, on, uh, and talking about showing this like uh, person was presenting uh, that in Firefox Nightly, you could use source maps to show uh, you know, WebAssembly um, being uh, in the browser, and so you can see some Rust code there in the web Firefox dev tools. Um, and so that like totally worked, and people were excited about it. There's just one problem. Uh, it's actually not great. Um, and uh, this is a quote from Ingvar, uh, sometimes known as our reverser uh, on the internet. Uh, we're gonna talk a little more about the, where this quote comes from in a second, but basically source maps were designed uh, for JavaScript. And so there's some things about them. I'm not gonna get into what those things are, but just the point is when you design something for JavaScript, but you need to use it for something else, it may not be as good at that something else as it was for JavaScript, and that's tricky. Um, so uh, basically, there's a bunch of problems with this approach, and so a lot of people said, you know what, we don't actually really want to use source maps to solve this problem. So what do you do? Well, also during the beginning of the presentation, if you do a lot of native tooling, you may be like, hey, people have had to deal with these problems for a long time. Like when you compile your C code into a binary and run it, you don't have the C source code anymore. So like that's the same problem we're talking about. It's not a novel problem. It's existed for a really long time. C has existed for a long time. And other languages that uh, you know weren't C. Also, like anything that's compiled in a binary directly has this problem. Um, and people have been debugging for a very long time. So why don't we take the problem, the stuff that they use to solve their problems and apply it to WebAssembly instead? So rather than copying JavaScript, maybe we should copy C and other native languages. Um, so this actually sort of is kind of true with WebAssembly itself. This idea of like sections in a binary, I'm sure it comes from a lot of places, but um, there's this thing called ELF, which is short for the executable and linkable format. And this is the, the way that programs that run on your Linux system um, or other similar like Unix systems, this is the format that they follow. So just like WebAssembly binary as a structure, your programs, like the binary files on your hard drive also have a structure. And if there are Linux programs, they'll follow this ELF format. Um, and so WebAssembly shares some similarities. I think some of this is just due to direct experience. Some of this is also just because like it's worked since the 70s, so or 80s, I guess. Um, and so like uh, why reinvent all the wheels and like these time-tested solutions to problems. So there's differences, obviously, but like a lot of the, there's a lot of similarities, especially if you squint. Um, and so uh, 
like that's how binaries are done there. So that's how binaries are done. So what does ELF use for debugging? Well, because the people who made these formats are giant nerds, uh, ELF has a debugging format called dwarf because that's a funny joke, elves and dwarves. Uh, and so dwarf, uh, you know, does is this debugging format that's used uh, to figure out debugging information from a particular elf uh, program. Um, and so in the Rust world, we kept by uh, using packages like Christmas Elf, which uh, is a library for dealing with Elf data um, in Rust, and then Gimli, which is a library for using Dwarf, because uh, Gimli is Dwarf if you're a Tolkien fan. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, so there's a rich amount of puns in this area, and that's how you know something is good, the more jokes it has, right? Um, <laughs> so anyway, uh, so Wasm learned a lot from Elf, like I said, and so why shouldn't debugging like learn from Dwarf? Um, it's a format that's been used for a long time. It's pretty good. Um, you know, with Dwarf tends to be a very Unix-centered thing. Uh, Windows has its own thing called PE to deal with this. Um, but like, uh, you know, it, if it worked once, why not do it again? And so this is kind of the direction that things are going. It seems like people think that using than uh, using source maps. And so there's these attempts to move stuff into uh, that. So like the brow like Dwarf. There's like great tools for debugging with Dwarf uh, on the native platform, but not on web browsers. So we're kind of in this funny kind of opposite situation where WebAssembly was originally made to be great. We're kind of moving the tooling from outside the browser into the browser and some web applications have only really dealt with source maps before. Um, so they don't like have native format support for Dwarf like many other native tools do. But since they do similar things, like we can make it work. And so that's the approach that Google has been taking lately um, by basically, this is Ingvar. So the quote from earlier was from this blog post called Improved WebAssembly Debugging in Chrome DevTools. But uh, DevTools in Chrome have been like basically adding support for Dwarf. So you'd be able to load up those things. And so it kind of feels very similar in many ways, the same way where if you want people to be able to debug in the browser, you ship source maps. This is like, instead of if you want to be able to debug in the browser, you ship Dwarf and then the, you're able to do that. Um, but it's not totally done yet. Um, while the basics work and you can check it out, there's some additional problems that are being worked through to make it more robust and also to support some other things. So for example, when I ran Wasm Pack, uh, it not only generated the WebAssembly, but then optimized it by shrinking stuff even further. And so the problem is the dwarf will get generated on the first step, but then we transformed the binary more and we didn't update the dwarf, so it's wrong. So you would like end up with weird results. And so there's work needed to be done in all of these tools to kind of like plumb every Everything through the stack in the right way to make sure that things are like working out. Um, and that's true also of Chrome's implementation itself. It's not complete and not done and, uh, you know, putting it in other browsers and things as well. So this is a very much an active area of development. And that's kind of the intention is that hopefully you just ship these debugging files along with your web application and you'll be able to use all of your native um, debugging tools in the browser to be able to debug WebAssembly in the browser. And then you can use GDB or LLDB or any of your other native debuggers with that dwarf as well to debug things that are outside of the browser. And we've kind of like unified the universe. Everything works and is happy. Um, but I think one thing that's interesting about this, and uh, basically this is, uh, I'm done here, but I wanted to mention like, yeah, this is all a work in progress. There's tons of room to like improve these tools and we'll see, maybe there'll be a bigger problem with Dwarf and people will decide to invent a new format instead. Um, Google seems to be really pursuing this um, approach and doing a lot of work on it. Um, and then, but there's also like WebAssembly outside of the browser. Um, there's lots of buzz. Mozilla seems to be more focused these days on outside of the browser than in the browser. Um, this is kind of like me looking from the outside. Like, uh, I don't know what these organizations are doing, but it seems to me like Google's really working on browser WASM and Mozilla's working on like WASI stuff. And that's really cool because it's great to use WebAssembly everywhere, but it's also interesting because the, the tools are a little bit better in native than not. Um, and so I think there's more interest in working on WASI itself natively rather than worrying about Dwarf right now. So it's like kind of unclear how much this is gonna get sorted out on what time frame, but there are people working on all sorts of aspects of this problem. Um, and so I think that we're gonna see a very healthy ecosystem for WASM both inside and outside of the browser, and we'll need to deal with the debugging problems in both ways. And so it's, it's great that all these different companies are working on this stuff and all the different people who work at those companies that are working on this stuff. Um, so with that, that is the end of my talk. Uh, thanks so much for listening. And uh, I have five more minutes. I'm happy to answer more questions. Uh, 
if you have any, uh, we can talk about the question you had, Mike, before the talk happened, if you want to know more about that, or just like kind of anything in general. Um, I'm, I'm happy to like give this last five minutes to talk about stuff. Cool. I'm glad that makes sense. Yeah, there's basically ways to transpile JavaScript in or WASM into JavaScript, and so you can kind of do some of that stuff. It's, it's, I'm not sure how reliable it is. <laughs> One interesting thing about this chat thing is it doesn't show if anyone is typing, which I think is normally good, but uh, is also kind of funny because I can't tell if anybody is even trying to ask a question. If we were in a normal conference, I would see if anyone had their hands raised. Um, oh, you're very welcome, Oleg. I'm glad it, I'm glad it uh, met your expectations. <laughs> Uh, okay, so um, Derek asked, uh, what's the issue around compiling JavaScript to WebAssembly? So what's interesting is that like, because browsers are implementing uh, WebAssembly as part of the JavaScript runtime, there's not a lot of pressure to compile JavaScript into WASM because if you want to support WASM and JavaScript, you basically use V8 or you use SpiderMonkey and you get both languages. So, um, so there's like not as much pressure there as there are in other places like with other languages. Um, and so it's kind of funny because a lot of people like would assume that JavaScript would be the first language you compile into WASM, but I'm not actually aware of a production ready implementation of compiling JavaScript into WASM because like it sort of doesn't make as much sense. I do think there's sort of an interesting idea of maybe eventually going all in on WASM and everything is only a WASM interpreter, but uh, it's more that like JavaScript tends to be that host environment and then the WASM is inside of it rather than it being like truly a universal platform, but we'll just see where it goes. Like, I don't know. I think it's very interesting and uh, you know, we'll see what happens. Um, uh, yeah, cool. Glad that answered your question. Uh, Matthew, you asked uh, why Rust seems to be ahead of the game compared to Go and other languages with their WASM work. I think there's sort of like two different uh, things. The first one is that Go, Rust does not have a large runtime. There's no garbage collection. And so earlier when I mentioned that if you compile a program, you need to also compile all of its kind of like runtime-y stuff. And so Rust is able to give you these very small binaries because you can only compile in just your own code and not a whole lot of support code. Um, that's not universally true. So for example, when I was working on this demo, um, I actually forgot to uh, a certain annotation and included all of the standard library in my code as well. And so my WASM binary was like one megabyte instead of like 84 bytes is I think how big the uh, the version that I showed you here today is. So that's one advantage that, that Rust has is that you can get these small binaries. And so that tends to be um, very positive. The second one is that we identified, so I, I'm on the Rust core team, um, we identified that we wanted, we knew WebAssembly seemed like a cool technology and we wanted Rust to work with it. And so the better, more serious reason why Rust is ahead on the WebAssembly support than a lot of other languages is because a lot of people who, to be clear, are not me, have put in a lot of time and effort and work into making that experience really nice and making sure that that works properly. Um, that's really like a lot of what it takes to make these things like work really well. There's a lot of languages that have like demo level WebAssembly support. Like I think I saw a program to compile Ruby into WebAssembly once, but it's not something the Ruby team is focused on or is like prioritizing. They have a lot of other stuff to do. Um, and so I think that's part of it is just like people who are willing to put in the work. Um, and so I think other languages over time will get better here. C Sharp especially is like really trailblazing the way with Blazor. Um, and I think that's like a big part of it. Um, so I hope that that helps sort of the two things, small binaries plus uh, that that part. Um, so uh, Oleg, you asked about why I'm outside the browser. Uh, I think the most interesting thing is using as a replacement for virtual machines. So uh, the guy who made Docker originally uh, had said that uh, if Wasm had existed when he made Docker, he may not have made Docker in the first place. And a lot of people were sort of confused by that. I gave a talk called uh, WebAssembly, uh, Rust, and the future of serverless that like kind of goes into this argument in general. But basically, like 
WebAssembly, because it's designed to be embedded in a browser, you can also embed it everywhere else. And so you could actually like kind of use WebAssembly as a way of isolating programs from each other. And that kind of gets into virtual machine slash Docker ter ter territory. And so um, there's kind of this really interesting possibilities in the future over there. We'll just sort of see how it goes. Um, and uh, last, David, in this last minute we got here, I'm, I'm glad that answers the question for you, Matthew. Uh, David, you asked how source code would be available with the developer tools of the browser. So what the formats like Dwarf do is they basically say, like, this function exists at this position in a file that has this name. So it'll say, like, source lib.rs line three position zero and that would be like the zeroth column in the file and so your tools would need to be able to map like what's in there to the source code itself so um i'm not actually 100 percent sure how this works in the browser specifically um but like that's the rough way that these things connect is basically the debug info says the function that lives in this part of the binary corresponds to this line and column of the source code. And so I'm imagining that the protocol has some way of like also grabbing the source code out too. Um, but uh, actually I haven't, I haven't thought about that directly. I'm used to it being in native tools where it loads it from the file system. Um, but I think that there's like some way of, uh, of also produce like giving the source code. Um, so yeah, that's kind of like the, the rough way that it works. Um, but you're right that I don't know if you also then serve the source code or if maybe it's running locally, you're able to like get it somehow. Um, I'm not actually 100% sure, to be honest with you. Cool, cool. Well, uh, my time is up. Thanks so much again, everybody. Uh, have a great rest of the conference and thanks for listening. Thanks for